Our communion meditation is from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 3. That's Isaiah 53, 1 to 3. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this portion of your word that shows us so clearly the Lord Jesus Christ, our suffering servant. Open our eyes to behold him and use this word for the edification of your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Oftentimes, in, we have opportunities in our lives to share the gospel and to be a witness for others. And that is something we, sh- we, uh, we are, in fact, commanded to do. But oftentimes, when we do, people don't respond. They don't receive the message. They don't believe, or they just seem very uninterested in what we have to say. It just seems irrelevant or seem closed But the question is, why is that the case? Why is it that people don't believe? That question is what this passage in Isaiah speaks of. And it it discusses this problem of unbelief in three parts. The fact of unbelief, the reasons for unbelief, and the remedy for unbelief. First of all, the fact of unbelief. In verse 1, Isaiah begins by saying, Who has believed our report? The word report could also be translated message. Who has believed the message? And it's referring to the message of the gospel. And this question, who has believed our report, is, it's a question of, really a question of lament and surprise. Who has believed our report? Why? Why do so few believe? This verse is quoted in the New Testament um, in two places, in Romans 10 and in John 12. And the passage in John 12 particularly sheds light on its meaning. In John 12, 37, it says, speaking about, about Jesus, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. People's hearts are hardened and their eyes are blinded, and that is why they don't don't believe. Then in in verses 2 and 3, Isaiah gives us reasons for unbelief. Verse, which say, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, There is no beauty that we should desire him. That uh, verse is using two metaphors to talk about how people thought about Jesus. The word tender plant is actually refers to a sucker, which is a sucker, as many of you know, I'm sure, is just a little shoot that comes out of a the main stem of a plant. That it's small and insignificant, not only that, but it's a nuisance that usually takes life from the rest of the plant. 
And a root out of dry ground is a plant that is growing in dry soil. And of course, a plant that doesn't have good soil is weak and doesn't seem promising. It usually has to be cared for carefully and is unlikely to survive. And so that is how people saw and thought about Jesus, his life. He didn't seem outwardly impressive or attractive. He was born in a manger, not in a palace. He was from Nazareth. Nazareth was a small town in Galilee. Galilee was a place that the Jews in the south of Judea despised. And Nazareth was a place in Galilee that even fellow Galileans did not think much of. When Nathaniel was told that Jesus was from Galilee, he, from Nazareth, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And of course, to the Romans, the whole land of Israel was just a small, turbulent province in their empire. Not only that, but verse 3 says that Jesus was not particularly physically attractive or impressive looking. He wasn't like Saul, who was taller than any uh, of the other Israelites. And so to many, he seemed insignificant. Not only that, and so, uh, but he was a man of sorrows. Verse 3 says he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and rejected by men. And he didn't, Jesus didn't just suffer on the cross, but his whole life was one that was characterized by sorrow and suffering. He was almost killed at birth by Herod, and he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He had to endure rejection and unbelief of many people who would repeatedly turn away from his message. His own brothers didn't believe in him. His neighbors, the people of Nazareth, actually tried to kill him. He also endured much physical discomfort. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. People accused him of performing miracles by the power of Satan. He was slandered as a glutton and a drunkard. He was accused of being a deceiver, a false prophet, accused of blasphemy. The Jewish religious leaders sought to kill him over and over again. People rejected him, despised him, and turned away from him in unbelief, time and time again. And who rejected Jesus? It wasn't just the world. It wasn't just pagans or Gentiles. Notice that Isaiah says, we. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. It was the very professing people of God who rejected Jesus. John 1.11 says that he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And people still reject Jesus today, often for the same reasons. He's unimpressive or unattractive, or doesn't seem relevant at all. And sometimes people will even praise him as though he was a good man or a good teacher or someone that, that did good things a long time ago, but they won't acknowledge that they're sinners and that their only hope for salvation is him and that they need him and need to submit to him as Savior and Lord. So people continue to reject, even to this day, and even some who would profess his name, Isaiah also points out not only the reasons for unbelief, but the remedy for unbelief. And that's given at the end of verse 1. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed the gospel message? This is a, a parallelism. And so what Isaiah is saying here is that the people who believe the report, believe the message, are those to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed. And the arm of the Lord is a way of speaking of God's power, his might. So the, the remedy for unbelief is God's power, God revealing the truth. God is the one who can unstop the deaf ears. He's the one who opens blind eyes. He is the one who softens hard hearts. And it is only when he stretches out his arm with his power 
and gives people faith that they will believe the message of the gospel. It is God's saving power that is the remedy for unbelief. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what do you think of Jesus? How do you esteem him or not? Is he just someone who lived a long time ago or a good person or maybe a good man, but nothing more? You ashamed of him in his word? Or do you regard him as the suffering servant, the God man and the only savior for your sins? Only hope, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Is he the pearl of great price who is worth giving up everything for? If that is the case, then come to this table with faith and hope and rejoice that it is God's mighty power that enables you to believe. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are the servant of the Lord. You humbled yourself to become man. What a great humiliation that was. Your whole life was characterized with sorrow. You endured temptations of Satan, were despised and rejected by men, even, even your own relatives and neighbors. Your glory was veiled. People did not esteem you. Thank you for enduring all of that suffering for us. We praise you that what is impossible with men is possible with you. It is your power that causes people to believe. So stretch out your arm with your power so that people would be believe the gospel. Help us to come to this your table, beholding you by faith and esteeming you rightly as our mighty Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.